Thank you, Brother Richard and Miss Evelyn. I don't know what we do without Miss Evelyn. I appreciate you helping me get on the right page there. John 21, John 21, please. And also, 1 Peter chapter 1, John 21 and 1 Peter 1, and we'll be in John here, um, or we'll be in John first after a while here. Um, we've got some work to do uh, this morning in the Word, so I ask you to settle in and and uh, got your Bible in your lap, and let's ask God to do something in our hearts and in our lives. That's uh, what it's about, that God would have his way in our Monday. Um, we come on Sunday, gather as a church, we can grow in the words, we can go and live the gospel and proclaim the gospel, and that our lives would be right Monday through Saturday. So um, if you'd help me with that this morning. Last Sunday morning, we dealt with the question, America, an unchristian nation? And asked a few more questions. I'm going to bring this down a little bit. If America was a Christian nation at its birth, is it not anymore? And if it is, will it soon cease to be? What does all this have to do with me? And we saw from Israel's history that nations that turn their back on God have it coming. We uh, know that God did not pardon Judah for the innocent blood that filled their land. And we've known our share of that in America. And with Jefferson, we say, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just. This is a far cry from where America started. America started in greatness. And I'll tell you another reason why she did, or tell you a reason, voices from our history poetically piece this together many, many years ago. Listen to this. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her rich mines and her vast world commerce, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her public school system and her institutions of learning, and it was not there. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her democratic congress and her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went to the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because she is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. America has enjoyed greatness because America started in goodness. And better read people than I suggest that America was great because of the good that Christianity did for her. Because of Christian ideals, of Christian principles, of good Christian people who lived and promoted all of the above out of a desire for freedom and liberty and justice for all. America was great because Christians were. And if that is true, then it seems we are removing our ship away from that safe harbor. While not desiring to be a prophet of doom for America, I do not wish to be ignorant of how God has worked in history and how he has displayed his perfect justice toward the nations. And while not desiring to be pessimistic about the condition of American Christians, I do not wish to sugarcoat the fact that American Christians probably need revival. I know I do frequently. And while not desiring to sound like something less than a patriot, I do not wish to be ignorant of the lessons that passionate, patriotic people have learned before me, especially if they have learned these lessons from the Master himself. Peter was one such person. As we began to look at his life last week, we would probably agree that Peter was the big bearded guy with the big lifted Bubba truck, right? With, a, with a, uh, an American flag on one side of the tailgate and a MAGA flag on the other. He said, it's MAGA. You'll get it in a second. He was her typical blue-collar, make Israel great again. Fisherman of Galilee, the region of conservative Israeli grassroots movements. And Peter, like many of us, was impulsive. Say, not me. Okay. Struggled to forgive, but was chock full of common sense, or at least he thought he was. When Peter saw the miracles Jesus performed and heard the message that Jesus proclaimed, he said, he's it. 
He's the answer for Israel. He's the Messiah. He's the one who will truly make us great again. So of course I'll follow you, Peter hollered as he hopped out of his John boat and forsook everything and followed the Lord. And Jesus spoke of big plans he had for Peter and the rest of the disciples. Remember in Matthew 16, after Peter made his confession, now at the Christ, the son of the living God, and Jesus said, you got it. And no man told you this. You didn't get this from man. You got this from my Father, which is in heaven. And on this fact that I am the son of the living God, I will build my church. Hell's gates won't stop it. And here's the keys to heaven's gate, Peter. Wow, big plans. And then we've been studying Jesus' final discourse in the garden. And there in John 14, Jesus mentioned to his disciples, I tell you the truth, guys, those people that believe on me, the man that believes on me, the works I do, he will do. And he will do greater works than what I've done because I'm leaving to my father. Gentlemen, whatever you ask the father in my name, I will do it. Wow. Big plans empowered by God himself. Jesus scratched Peter's itch for a new day in Israel. He promised Peter what Peter hoped and yearned and longed for. Jesus was the Messiah and great things were coming in Peter's own life and land. So you can imagine on the heels of his superb statement in Matthew 16, you can imagine Peter's surprise when Jesus said, Shh, don't tell anyone I'm the Messiah. You're going to suffer and die. You can feel Peter's disgust in the upper room. When Jesus said, fellas, all of you are going to be offended because of me tonight. You will be scattered. Simon, Simon, Satan wants to get a hold of you so he can shred you like wheat. Your face flushes with shame with Peter as Jesus warned them. I tell you, Peter, before the cock crows this day, you will deny me thrice. And Peter, of course, was confident the Lord would not die. And he would personally never be ashamed of Jesus, saying, though I would die with you, I will not deny you. And the rest of the disciples assured Jesus of the same thing. And yet when they went to the garden with Jesus, Jesus wrestled while they rested. Jesus agonized in prayer, sweating great drops of blood from the pressure and eternal stress that was upon him in the moments that lay ahead, yet surrendering to drink the bitter cup of death that the Father slid across the table to him, saying, Not my will, but thine be done. All the while Peter slept. He didn't wrestle in prayer with Jesus. He didn't watch for one hour during Jesus' darkest hour. His weakness got to him. And we saw last week what happened next, that Jesus woke Peter up as the soldiers' torches lit up the garden and the agents of darkness arrived to haul Jesus off to the courts of evil. And Peter, with all the passion in his soul for God and country, he drew his sword and got the swinging. And he missed Malchus's head, but he got his ear. And we're in John, and we looked at what John said last week, but listen to what Jesus said to Peter from Matthew's account, Matthew 26, 52. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. And he says, Don't you think I could pray to my Father, and he would give me twelve legions of angels? That's probably tens of thousands of angels right now. And he would deliver me from this, but it's not going to happen, because if it did, how would the Scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? God's word propelled Jesus forward in the face of evil, but Peter's patriotism tried to keep Jesus from the evil. And all the disciples bailed on Jesus in the garden and ran like scared chipmunks. And Jesus was arrested, but Peter followed afar off. And when he was able to at least get into the same building where the angry mob was being ridiculous to Jesus, he denied he even knew his best friend three times. Denied him. Immediately, the Bible says, the Lord turned, the cock crew, and the Lord looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, and he went out and wept bitterly. He had failed his friend. He had failed his Messiah, his hero. Well, what did Jesus do? We know what Jesus said in John 18. He, he told Pilate to his face, he said, listen, if my kingdom was from this world, my servants would fight, but they are not because my kingdom's not from here. This is why I came into the world. This is why I I was born, to testify, to bear witness of the truth. And everyone that hears the truth, that heareth my voice, or that is of the truth, he hears my voice. And Pilate, he just dismissed that altogether. He said, what is truth? And he he paid a political favor to the Jews 
who chose a man guilty of manslaughter over their Messiah. Jesus was whipped, scourged, tortured, stripped, shamed, and eventually crucified. Yet Jesus did the Father's will, exhaling with his last breath on that excruciating cross. It is finished. For Peter and the other disciples, it was over. Finished is what they felt like, but not in the same way Jesus meant it. No more four years. No Israel made great again. Their hope was shattered. Their hearts were crushed. They had failed Jesus totally. Miserably, and now he was gone. In the great game of chess that we call life, Peter made a patriotic move, but he lost. In an effort to make a great move for God and country, Peter gave up what was good. He denied the very Lord he swore he would not. And Jesus had warned him, Whosoever will save his life will lose it, but whosoever will lose it for my sake, the same shall find it. For what will it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? And Peter tried to gain the whole world back for Jesus, a noble thing, but he did it his way and he lost his own soul. He swung his sword, but he denied the Lord. He failed to be the great Christian he thought he was when he stood up for the liberty he wanted. And adding insult to injury, that following Sunday morning, some of the women came running from Jesus' tomb saying that someone stole his body. Someone stole his body. And and if you read John 20, you'll see that Peter booked it and cooked it into the tomb only to find it empty. Only for the mystery of his Lord's life and death to march on in his mind. Perhaps you feel like Peter today. Perhaps you feel confused. Confused about the chaos of our land. Confused about the election results. Confused about the millions of voices screaming their billions of opinions. Confused about what Jesus expects of you right now and how Jesus sees America and why Jesus wants you to do what he wants you to do. Perhaps you're confused. Perhaps you feel fear. Perhaps you're afraid of our nation's future. Perhaps you're afraid of the haters and how they will treat you. Perhaps you're afraid of what exactly the next administration is going to do. Perhaps you're afraid of government. Perhaps you're afraid of what what it might be like to follow Jesus and get his gospel to the world and be in this 100%. Perhaps you're afraid of what might happen if you go all in for the Lord. Perhaps you're afraid. Perhaps, like Peter, you feel failure. Perhaps you look at your life, you look at how you've approached your life, you look at your priorities and you look at your positions on different issues and how you have handled those with your disposition. And you think, perhaps I've not been or done or thought what Jesus wants me to be, do or think. Perhaps you reflect on the freedom that you've had in the greatest country on the face of the planet only to realize you've used it for yourself. Instead of investing it into Jesus' work in the lives of other people. Perhaps you realize the reasons you want our country to remain great are selfish reasons. Having more to do with your physical and financial well-being rather than a sincere desire for freedom for all. Now, if I could take a step back and say I'm all for law and order. And we need a country that has law and order. And we want a country where we have the freedom to worship God. And we have the freedom, the right to pursue happiness Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and we're all for that. That all came from a biblical foundation. But perhaps in our pursuit of the American dream, we have become incredibly self-centered. Perhaps your response to everything that's been going on has left you with a bloody sword and a guilty conscience for denying your Lord. Perhaps you feel like a failure. Perhaps you ponder the needs of our land and you recognize it'd be great if America was great again. But I'm thinking American Christians should be made great again. Well, that's our title this morning. Make Christians great again. Make Christians great again. Again, for if it was great Christians bringing goodness to the table in early America that made America great, then surely... Great Christians bringing goodness to the table and modern America can make a difference again, whether or not America wants to come and dine. 
But how? How can a man be a great Christian? And how can he be just a good one? I mean, forget greatness. How about just being good? How can we slice through the fog of our confusion? How can we cancel the culture of our fears? How can we get back up on our feet after we've failed? Well, what happened to Peter? What did he learn? Do you think he learned anything from all this? I think so. Maybe we can learn and be helped. And that newly carved an inhabited tomb was found empty. We know that Jesus had risen from the dead. Peter had forgotten this, even though Jesus told him it would happen. The angel in Mark 16 told the women, Be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they lay him. Go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him as he said unto you. We also learn from Luke's account how the two who walked on the road to Emmaus with Jesus, when they realized it was Jesus, they rose up and ran back to Jerusalem and they found the eleven gathered together and those that were with them saying, The Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. And Paul also confirmed this in 1 Corinthians 15 that Christ was seen of Cephas, Simon, Peter, then of the twelve, like a toddler who doesn't want to have a face-to-face with his father. After he did a big no-no and his father gave him the look, Peter could wait to see Jesus again. He could wait. He didn't want to see him after Jesus looked him in the eye when that rooster crowed. But you know what? Jesus couldn't wait to see Peter again. He could not wait. And by the time we get to John 21, he was visiting with Peter again the third time, verse 14 says. Look, if you see in verse 14, after that he was risen from the dead. And you go early on in this chapter, Simon has told the other disciples that are there, I go off fishing. And there they go. And we talked about this a few weeks ago. But um, they fished all night and then they didn't catch anything. When the morning came, Jesus is on the shore and they've got nothing. And he says, why don't you cast your net on the other side? And they do that and they bring in a haul. And John realizes this isn't any normal catch. That's the Lord. You ever just have one of those moments? That is the Lord. That's a God moment right there. That was what John did. And Peter was so excited about that. He just got his coat back on him and he jumped in the water. Here we go. And he swam the shore and there Jesus was. And he had breakfast ready and he had fish on the fire. And Peter with his strength, he pulled in that haul of fish to the shore and they sat down around the fire. It's breakfast with Jesus. They probably didn't have bacon So they couldn't have dirty eggs, but maybe they had some eggs after the fish cooked. I don't know. But they sat around that fire with Jesus. And Jesus needed to talk to Peter about something. And he asked him in verse 15, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. Are you kidding me? Because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, you know all things. Thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, feed my sheep. And Jesus challenged Peter to face his failure and called him to follow him. He didn't sugarcoat Peter's failure. He dealt with it. Three times Peter said, I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. And three times Jesus asked, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times Peter said, you know I do, but just not like you want me to. Not quite like you want me to. And how could Peter love Jesus? Jesus said, feed my sheep. Tend to my sheep. Take care of my sheep. Shepherd my sheep. It was Peter's selfishness on display when he denied the Lord. It would be Peter's selflessness in action in order to prove he loved the Lord. And take care of his people. Feed his sheep. It was Peter's love for Peter when he swung that sword. It would be Peter's love for Jesus when he would pick up a staff, when he would pick up a lamb, when he would guide the sheep. In fact, Peter, like Jesus said, a disciple must be willing to do. And like Peter said he would do, 
Peter would eventually die for the Lord. Look at verse 18. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And in verse 19, he says, follow me. So what did Peter do? He followed Jesus. Follow him in Acts. In Acts 1, he's leading the 120 or so sheep of the early church to replace Judas, according to what God was teaching him from the scriptures. He was preaching to unbelieving sheep from around the globe in Acts 2 that led to 3,000 sheep being added to the fold for him to tend for their Lord. He was making a lame sheep walk again. In Acts chapter 3, that led to at least 5,000 sheep being added to the fold for him to feed for the Lord. He was preaching to hostile sheep in Acts 4 and 5, the religious wax who had crucified Jesus. And Peter shot straight and he won it back down and he wouldn't obey when they said, shut up with this Jesus business. In Acts 4 and 19, Peter said, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, you figure that out. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In chapter 5, when the establishment came after them again and brought them to trial, asking, didn't we tell you to stop this? To stop talking about Jesus? You're making us look like the bad guys. Then Peter and the other apostles stood up and they answered, we ought to obey God rather than men. And they commenced to preach the gospel to the Christ-rejecting Jewish authorities. This is the civil disobedience of the apostles. We'll get back to that later. We get to Acts chapter 8 and we find Peter walking to the other side of the tracks to preach to the, to the Samaritans, sheep not of the fold. We get to Acts chapter 9 and Peter is making his rounds and feeding the flocks in Jerusalem, healing believers in the name of the Lord and seeing many more come to faith in Christ. We get to Acts chapter 10 and Peter is crossing the aisle the political aisle, and to other barren pastors with no shepherds to speak of to preach to the Romans. Note this, he preached peace to a Roman centurion. The same kind of man who crucified his Savior and he didn't swing a sword at him. He preached the word. And Paul told Cornelius of Caesarea by the sea in Acts chapter 10 verse 34, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth God. And does what is right, worketh righteousness, is accepted with him. And he preached the gospel to the man. There were times his witness landed him on death row. Like in Acts chapter 12, there were times that he still struggled with issues of his past. Like in Galatians 2, when Paul had to rebuke him for favoring Jews over Gentiles. A little peer pressure, perhaps. A little racism, perhaps. A little politics, perhaps. Hey, Peter was human like you and like me. But all in all, Peter proved he loved the Lord. Peter had failed, and Jesus dealt with that, and Peter responded, and Peter followed the Lord. He had gotten way down, but he was not out. His failure was not final. His denial was not his last trial. He replaced the sword with the gospel of the Lord. He replaced self with the Savior. He replaced his beating heart for Israel and rebuilding it with a heart for Jesus' church and adding to it. Peter got up off his duff, a diamond in the rough, followed the Lord, and he saw great things happen in Jesus' name, just as Jesus said he would. It's awesome. You might feel like a royal failure. I've been there. You say, I stick my foot in my mouth all the time. I often tell people I'd like to carry around a bottle of Hershey's syrup with me in case I've got to do that again. I can squirt some on there as it's coming up. Coming up. You might say, how many disciples have I made? How many people are here because of me? How many people are going to heaven because I told them about Jesus? How many people are acting like they're going to heaven because I discipled them? You know how much I've denied I even know the Lord in my life? At work, by the things I say, by the things I do. I'm a mess. Ask my wife. Your failure is not final. 
See, Peter, in selfishness, he rebuked the Lord. He swung his sword. He denied the Lord. He failed. And he could have just as easily kept his eyes on himself and had a pity party the rest of his life and holed up down in the holler somewhere, and that would have been just as selfish. But Jesus called him to love, which is denying self for someone else. Jesus called him to love Jesus and love people. It's that simple. And Peter did it. And he went on to do greater works than what Jesus did in his ministry in Israel. Failure is not final. Let Jesus deal with your failure his way. He won't sweep it under the rug. He won't just give you a hug and say, it's okay, just don't do it again, buddy. He will prove your love for him. He will put it to the test. So let Jesus move your love away from yourself and toward his people, toward the people that need him. Let Jesus make you a Christian, a good one, a great one. Sir, you can be that. Ma'am, you can be that. Young man, you can be that. Young lady, you can be that. You can look like Jesus. You can touch the life of someone else so they end up looking like Jesus too. You can do it. It happened to selfish, sword-swinging Peter. It can happen to you. Are you still breathing? It can happen to you. Can you take one step at a time? It can happen to you. Can you pray? It can happen to you. Can you serve? It can happen to you. Can you love? It can happen to you. Can you talk about Jesus? It can happen to you. Will you let Jesus continue to make you what he wants you to be? Will you allow him to make you great at the Christian life? You can be. You can stay that way if you're there. Will you let him deal with you and propel you forward in his power? Now, it's one thing to know a Christian can be restored and revived. It's another thing entirely to know what being a Christian, a good Christian in our present situation looks like. Wouldn't it be nice if one of the apostles had written... A letter or two for people who were hated by many in their land, who were seen as hostile to their culture. Wouldn't it be nice if Peter got real specific to Christians about how exactly they should navigate, what liberties they have, and even how they should respond to the government and how they should conduct themselves when they feel like, oh, strangers in their own land. Wait a minute. Peter did. The letter he wrote is in your lap. Is your finger still on 1 Peter? Good. Turn there. You see, Peter wrote 1 and 2 Peter to believers scattered across Roman territories in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. Before Thanksgiving, I thought I'd throw that in. He wrote it around the time of vicious persecution started by Emperor Nero. Nero was a whack job. and He basically burned down Rome so he could build it bigger. You don't need a leader who's going to burn everything down for his own agenda leaving his citizens devastated and himself with a mess to blame on somebody else, like a good politician. So we blame the Christians, and a terrible time began for them. They were now targets of Rome and her citizens, very much strangers in their own land. And what would Peter say to them? Pick up the sword, fight for your liberty, stand up for your rights. Well, let's have a look-see, shall we? And 1 Peter chapter 1, out of the gate in 1 Peter 1, Peter reminded these believers of their lively hope. Look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. He's given us life again, a new birth, born again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You say, I was hoping for a different election result. Perhaps you were. Was that a lively hope? How about heaven? How about Jesus Christ? Is that a lively hope? You bet. You have eternal life and faith by him. Peter would say that these people's faith in Jesus, though under fire, was precious. And though they had never seen Jesus, they loved him and had cause to rejoice right now because of their salvation. So Peter told them in verse 13 to focus on being like Jesus. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Get your thinking under control. My mom would say, stop that stinking thinking. Get it under control. Be sober. Think straight. And hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not as a stubborn toddler who insists he have his way with his parents in the marketplace, at at church, 
As obedient children, not fashioning, not shaping your life according to the desires you used to have and your ignorance when you didn't know Jesus, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy. Be set apart. Have a life of love. Have a life of service. Have a life of purity in every corner of your life, in all manner of conversation, and see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently, he says later. In chapter 2, he called them a holy nation, a peculiar people. The people of God called to display the glory of one who had called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. He called them strangers and pilgrims and pleaded with them to stay away from the desires of your flesh, which are constantly making war against your soul. You say, I just feel like I got to have it. I got to feel like I I feel like I got to have it. I got to scratch the itch. I can't say no. The temptation is too strong. You're yielding to the enemy who's got a target for your soul. He said, don't do that. Live an honest life among the world so that even if they talk trash about you and accuse you of hate, all they can do is see how awesome God is because of your good life. It sounds like the Sermon on the Mount. It sounds like Peter heard this somewhere else. And how could they have an, onverse, on, an honest conversation among the haters? Watch this. Look at verse 13. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Every ordinance, every ordinance of the government that opposed them, every last one, whether it be to the king as supreme or on the governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. And then if 15 and 16, guys, this is God's will, that, that you would silence their stupidity, their ignorance with goodness. You're free. But don't use your liberty as a cover for your own selfishness and wrongdoing. I'm a free man. I have rights. I have liberties. I'll stick it in the government's eye if I want to. Don't do that, he said. But as the servants of God. 17, honor all men. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Now, obviously... When the authorities told them to stop preaching in Jesus' name, what do they do? We ought to obey God rather than men. And again, I repeat, that was their civil disobedience. God has called us to gather as a church. We can do that in freedom, as we do in America in a church building, or if we were like the saints in China who have to meet underground, we could still do that, but we're called That no matter what the government says to gather as a church, we're called no matter what the government says to get the gospel into the hands of sinners. And no matter what they say, it's those two hills that we live on and we die on. That's the line the Bible draws. In chapter 3, he argued, you want to love life? You say, how can I love life in America going into the future? You can. You want to love life? Then love each other. Be of one mind. Does that sound familiar? Have compassion and pity for others. Be courteous. Don't let chivalry die with you. Don't get even with others. Don't get bitter. Get better. And if you follow Jesus, guess what? Surprise, surprise. You're going to have plenty of opportunities to tell people about Jesus. Even if the people you're telling are coming at you. Look at chapter uh, 3, verse 13. He says, And who is he that will harm you if you be followers of that which is good? If you do suffer right, if you do suffer for doing right, be happy. Don't be terrified, but sanctify, he says, the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let me ask you, why would they ask you for a reason for that hope if you are not living in hope? If they all they see in front of them is a disgruntled Republican or Democrat, whatever you are, If all they see is a disgruntled, politically-minded American, and they don't see someone who's living with hope and peace and calm, why would they want to ask you about Jesus and what he did for you? He goes on, have a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. It's better if God wills it, if God allows it, that you suffer for doing right. And he said, don't try to avoid suffering like this. 
Be like Christ and you suffering for the glory of God. In chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, he basically told them, because Christ suffered, you should be willing to suffer. So stop living for pleasure in the desires of the Roman dream, he said to these people. Start living for the will of God. He called them to be serious about the time they had left to follow Jesus, to pray, to love, to serve the church there in chapter 4, to rejoice in the Lord. In chapter 5, he basically said, don't have a spirit of pride, but of humility. Look at verse 5 of chapter 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Even if the elder decides it may be the wisest thing to enforce mask wearing. You say, that's a bucket of worms. Perhaps. But what if? What if? I'm just saying, what if? Would you walk? Or would you wear? Is that a hill you want to die on? We have an outbreak in the church and two people die. And I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm about to change something. But what if the governor said this would be the wisest course of action? And this pastor led that way. What would we do? Do we want to move the gospel down the field and five years from now be the church that just did a right thing that didn't make it a hill we were going to die on and drop our flag in the ground and just we'll do what we got to do? Or are we going to just say, I'm fearless. And I appreciate courage. I'm fearless. And we have something go wrong. And in five years, you try to invite someone to church and say, hey, I'm from Emmanuel Baptist Church. Where? Why don't you come to church? Wait, where are you from? Emmanuel Baptist. Oh, that church. That's happening to churches all across this land. All across this land. He says, yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. It's going to happen. Just humble yourself. He'll lift you out of the muck and the mire. And in the meantime, he says, casting all your care. Upon him, for he careth for you. And Peter had to write another letter to the same people, Second Peter. Because false teachers, proud and cocky false teachers, were cropping up and causing trouble in the churches. And Peter told these believers, even though God has given believers everything they need for their life and for their walk with God through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and even though believers must build their faith in Jesus Build on that faith and live a godly life. And even though believers have the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth, there are many in Christian circles that don't follow the truth, making the truth evil spoken of. In chapter 2, he points out the marks of false teachers that obviously they deny the Lord Jesus and behind the scenes and get off on on the doctrinal matters of Jesus. But notice something interesting about these guys in verse 10. It says, but chiefly they, them that walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness, their own desire after the desires, just their dirty desires. And watch what they do. They despise government. Presumptuous, arrogant, proud are they. Self-willed. Not at all qualified to lead people, according to Paul's letter to Titus. He said a pastor is not to be self-willed, but these false teachers were. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Now listen, remember John the Baptist. He told Herod, marrying your brother's sister is wrong. When the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, Herod's going to come after you, Peter said, you tell that fox. Jesus and John the Baptist, they knew where the line was drawn and the apostles knew where the line was drawn and they preached the word with boldness. They knew where it was drawn, but sometimes it can be taken past that line. Whereas angels, it says in 11, which are greater in power and might, bring not railing accusation against him before the Lord. We may not have pastors and churches and Christians in our circles that are getting off on Jesus in America. Are you with me? But we have plenty of people who are jumping on the radical left train and the radical right train, both, and taking their freedom of speech a little too far. Civility is lost. This is not Christian. What folks like this are truly, look at verse 12. He says that these as natural brute beasts, they're like stupid animals, he said. 
Verse 13, there's spots and blemishes. They add ugliness to the church. Verse 17, there are wells without water, clouds carried with a storm. Oh, look, there's a cloud coming. We need some rain, and it doesn't rain. You're out of water in the house, and you go out to the well. This is back in the, I'm not going to say the olden days. They'll get in trouble. I already said it. You go out to the well, and you drop the bucket down there, but you get no well up. Disappointing. You wanted water. You wanted water. You wanted the crops. You wanted to be able to bathe. You wanted to be able to do what you needed to do. You went there, and you didn't get what you're looking for. It promised liberty and life, but it cannot deliver. That's what these people are. So, hey, Peter would say, be mindful of the truth about our times in Second Peter 3. In the last days, scoffers will mock God's word. Get used to it. It's not going to get better. It's going to get worse, but it's God's word that holds heaven and earth together. Look at chapter 3, verse 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Doomsday is coming. And when is that day going to come? Why hasn't it come yet? Well, time is irrelevant to our timeless God. Look at verse 8. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. We say, well, what is God waiting on? Verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Oh, God's a slacker. He's not coming back. No, that's not him. He's long-suffering to us. We're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You have some blatant atheist who says, your Lord's never coming back. Look at this crazy world and all its problems. God is dead. I mean, what is he waiting on? You. He doesn't want you to perish on doomsday. He wants you to repent today. And just because his coming seems like it ain't coming, that doesn't mean it ain't coming. The day of the Lord will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night. And you don't expect a burglar to show up. You just do your best to prepare for when that might happen. Well, the Lord's coming is no might happen. It is going to happen. So prepare. Look at verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heaven shall pass away with a great noise. And the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And then Peter brought this home for the believers. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat? You say, you mean the world is going to disintegrate, including America? Yes. And we don't look to this earth for eternal joys and happiness. Look at verse 13. Look what we're looking for. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise... Look for new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And if that be the case, if that's what we're looking for, 14, Peter says, Wherefore, beloved, seeing that you look for such things, be diligent, work hard at it every day, every day, every day, that ye may be found of him in peace without spot. Stop driving your bicycle of life through the mud puddles. You got a trail. Stop it. Be found of him without spot and blameless and account that the long suffering of God, the reason he hasn't come yet, the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. God waits on the world because he wants the world to be saved. He waits to make his move to bring law and order that this world needs and can have for eternity. Why? Because people still need salvation. They still need the gospel. Not every immigrant has migrated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son. And they can do that legally through the justification of Jesus Christ. But let me ask you, why would churches close their borders? So Peter says, don't fall in 17. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also being led away with the error of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. You've been doing great. You've been running hard. You've been staying the course and keeping the faith and running your marathon. Watch out. You don't fall away, but rather grow in grace. And then the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to him be glory both now and forever. Amen.
men. Say, hopefully that amen will end the sermon. Well, we've covered a lot of ground here, haven't we? What does this all boil down to? What was the essence of Peter's message? Why should believers live like Jesus in a hostile world? Why should they function this way? Turn back to 1 Peter 1. Now that you're at 1, go to 2. Verse 21. For even hereunto were ye called. You say, what, I, I want to know what God has called me to do with my life. It's right here. You don't have to have a, 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 a PhD. You don't have to have a fuzzy experience in the backwoods at camp. You want to know what God has called you to do? The phone's ringing. And here it is. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, and neither was guile found in his mouth. Remember who's saying this? This is Peter. While I'm out in the courtyard denying I even know him, guile in my mouth, he's in there. And guile is not in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. And why did he do that? Who his own self bear your sin and his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray. Wait, wait, wait. Peter's feeding the sheep. Ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Tradition has it that Peter watched his wife be crucified. And he encouraged her with these words, remember the Lord. And when he had his turn, it's, reported that he pled with them, that he was not worthy to be crucified like his Lord, but rather should be crucified upside down. And that is how Peter died under Nero's persecution. Death is coming for all of us. Whether we die in freedom or under a government of hate. So we might as well go out great. And pastor always would say, if you... You want to live well, but you want to die well. And if you want to go out great, you might as well live great and be a Christian and be like Jesus. And he says today to you and to me, like he said to Peter at that breakfast so long ago, follow me. Follow me. Stand with me if you would, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed. The hawks will come and will sing. Verse of invitation, just as I am. You say, I'm not too fond of what I am. In the light of the word of God, well, I'm with you there. (laughs) Sunday's always coming and it's a wonderful day. But what about tomorrow? Will I look like Jesus tomorrow? Why don't we take some time to pray and to sing to him and ask him from our hearts, help me, Jesus, be like you, brother.